Welcome back. I'm talking to Max Burns about the Sheffield UFO incident, which took place in 1997. Now, questions were asked in Parliament about this incident, Max. Um, can you give us the name of the MP and just briefly tell us what was asked? Sure. Uh, Helen Jackson, uh, MP Labour for Sheffield, uh, answered a, a number of questions to the, um, to the Defence Minister. Um, I think it was Speller uh, at the time. One of the questions was, what reports have been collected by the police regarding a UFO sighting and incident in Sheffield on the 24th of March 1997? So can I just send her up there, Max? H how did she um, get wind of this? Uh, did you contact her and, get, and try and get her to ask questions? Or what, what, was, what was her motivation? Because it's not the typical sort of question an MP would ask. She was contacted by uh, uh, acting as a journalist at the time. I'll use that phrase with inverted commas. Uh, Dr. David Clark and she uh, because she was she was she was more interested in the fact that over sixty thousand pounds had been spent on a search and rescue operation which then got abruptly called off at eleven thirty a m the following morning so there was enough stuff going on that night for a full uh, and also there was an air exclusion order for a ten mile radius uh, around the center of the incident which meant that no aircraft or helicopters or anyone could fly into the area which for me, well, they were closing the area off to stop people flying in like the press mm -hmm. and things like that. So she tabled a number of questions to the, I think it was um, George Speller, I think his name was, but mm -hmm. I stand corrected, but he, right. was the, he was the defence minister at the time. And he replied with, no reports of UFOs have been received by my office. That wasn't the question that he was asked. He was asked what reports of UFOs that night had been received by the police. And the fact of the matter is that I've got the police log of the incident and there was a large number of UFO reports in the police log mm -hmm. received by the police. So the defence minister didn't answer the question that he was asked. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what, so what is the evidence that a, a search was conducted? What, you mentioned the closing off of an area because there's a military term that they use when they when they close this area off, they, they send this message out to various parts of the Air Force. Uh, I, I've actually got a copy of the, um, of the, it's called a NOTAM. A NOTAM. Yeah, and, and that stands for Notice to Airmen. Uh, and it was, uh, I got it off, um, uh, it's, uh, I think it's RAF Drayton, it's next to Heathrow. Uh, they sent me a copy of the actual NOTAM, mm -hmm. and it says an air exclusion order was put in place uh, with, the, with the GPS location, for a 10 mile square radius, Manchester Airport was informed, although they later denied that there was any such air exclusion order, but I've got a copy of the air exclusion order. Right. So no, all aircraft landing at Manchester Airport had to divert right. uh, around the air exclusion order. All right, so we've got all of this evidence which points to perhaps something crash landing and perhaps a search being conducted, but there are people who say, well, there's no way you could, you could hide a jet fighter crashing in the Peak District. Someone's gonna see it, someone's gonna know about it. Oh, well, that, that's, that's completely untrue. Uh, the only other jet that's cr uh, crashed in the Peak District was um, a Hawker Hunter jet, um, a man called, I think his name was Wallace Cubitt. Uh, I, I also have the AAIB Air Investigation Incident Report for that crash. And the parameters of the crash uh, are this, that his Hawker Hunter jet crashed into the Peak District bog moorland, um, generated a crater 60 foot in diameter, and the plane was almost completely buried and the only evidence above ground was a few bits of wreckage around the rim of the crater which could easily be picked up and the rest of the plane was uh, completely submerged in fact they've never ever got that plane out of the bog um, and mr cubit that that is his burial site he is right. there in the aircraft under the peat bog so uh, this was in 94 is that right uh, I, th I think so yeah right all right what so were there any um, eyewitnesses near the, near where you think the crash site was then, or w w oh. w were there not um, a couple of fire engines called? Oh yes, there was a uh, there was a a number of fire engines and fire officers. They were called to the they were at the Strines pub, which is right kind of dead center of the incident. Um, there was a girl called Sharon Aldridge. She was a, a bar person at the Strines pub, and her and her friend had, came out to see what was going on. And the first fireman that they spoke to 
said that um, a light aircraft had gone down in the Peak District and then about 20 minutes later they spoke to another fireman who said that a military jet had gone down and then when they said well we thought it was a light aircraft he went oh yeah that's right that's what it was. The following day uh, the two girls were interviewed by some plain clothes officers mm -hmm. uh, with giant whip aerial on their on their car and took full statements off them, but she wasn't completely certain that they were police officers. You, you suspect you found the possible crash site. Now well, a couple of metal detectorists have right. uh, uncovered this. Right. Now, so I, I read online somewhere that that site where there's this crater is possibly a World War II bomb. Would you, you don't think so? Ac uh, according to the information supplied to me by the two metal detectorists, uh, including photographs of the crater, uh, there's tree damage still visible mm -hmm. uh, in a straight line for, for th about 300 feet as it comes down and the crater is approximately 30 or 40 feet across and I believe that this is the impact site of the engine not the main aircraft. Now uh, they've, they've uncovered about 50 pieces of titanium jet engine parts that wasn't used in aircraft until 1969 with the SR-71 Blackbird. Uh, and there's only two jets ever crashed in the Peak District and both of them locations are nowhere near this site. This is not a World War II bomb, this is jet engine titanium blades of, uh, which is in possession and obviously I'll supply you with the photographs of these. Mm -hmm. Alright, now um, let's come on to certain UFO organisations, well namely Bufora because he, uh, as you were investigating this case you were in touch with uh, various people because you needed a platform to put out your findings which would be in the media and in UFO magazines and organizations so just tell us how that transpired it started off because um, uh, Dr David Clark as he is now um, he was the press officer for Bufora and he wrote a 20 page report on the incident before I completed my investigation summarizing that nothing had occurred uh, not, uh, you know, usual explanations of a bolide meteor and this kind yeah. of thing and all the usual, uh, you know, scapegoat excuses. And uh, I, was, I was blocked from actually uh, presenting my findings for Bufora. Steve Gamble actually resigned as the chairman of Bufora because he came under such pressure. D uh, David Clark rang him up at home and told him not to allow me to speak on a Bufora platform. And Bufora... Uh, uh, I mean, I, I'm still holding a, a report on the incident that night from a witness uh, 25 miles away who said that on the night in question at around 10 p.m. towards the Peak District Sheffield area, they saw what looked like someone striking a match in the night sky. Mm -hmm. Now, to see what looks like a match being struck from 25 miles away, uh, I think they've seen the aircraft exploding. Right. You know, th th but I've not been able to get this report. But believe me, that's what the report says. Uh, so, so Dr. David Clark, he was also uh, a journalist at the Sheffield Star at the time. He and was, yeah. They put out articles about this incident. So, so uh, how, d how do you think that they covered that, this event? Oh, G Clark called it, uh, I got accused of being a, an X-Files fantasist. But the only person that, that ever mentioned the, I like the X-Files by the way, it was good entertainment. Mm -hmm. But Clark uh, was the person that coined the phrase X-Files mystery in the peaks. And I've got the newspaper cuttings from the Sheffield Star. And uh, Clark uh, contradicted himself, you know, he's saying things like a thorough search of the, this is to Mike France, the head of the search and rescue. He, he said that, you know, uh, a thorough search of the Peak District was carried out according to Mike France and if there had been any wreckage they'd have found it. Well th the same day Mike France also did an interview with another journalist where he said uh, a thorough uh, inspection of the Peak District has, has not been carried out and it would take weeks to cover the entire area. Right. So either Clark's lying or Mike France has, has made two different statements. Right now we just come on to Clark and Roberts because they have written extensively, both of them, about UFO cases over the last, well, I don't know how many years. Th 30 years. 30 years. Now, let's, let's be nice, and uh, wh I'm going to describe what I believe their modus operandi is without trying to use too many derogatory comments. Um, when you have UFO incidents, such as 
uh, the Bowen Mountain case, uh, Ben Waters case, Sheffield case, the Milton Torres case, where you've got UFO phenomenon and you've also got military involvement, all of those cases. The government have to take a stance on those cases because their military hardware has been involved. So they must have a stance on it. Yeah? But they don't actually like to talk about it publicly. No, they don't make any statements. They don't. They use, they use mouthpieces. Well, you've said it. So, uh, oh. and, and we'll drive that narrative home again and again and again, no matter what it takes. They will, they will, argue, they will argue the government narrative to the point of absurdity. Yes. And in your article uh, in the magazine Notes from the Borderland, you actually accuse both of them of lying with, in pertaining to the, uh, the Sheffield incident. Well, I... Right. And ten years after that extensive, fully referenced and footnoted article was published, after making a, a lot of wind about offering a full rebuttal, uh, the silence has been deafening. Right. And, I mean, I just want to make one comment about um, that type of ufologist. I, I don't consider them to be ufologists. I, I, as I consider them, as you suggested, to be unofficial mouthpieces of, of the government narrative. That's how I would describe them. But what always surprises me is how some ufologists actually entertain them and debate with them and class them as a skeptic. I don't think they're skeptics. No, no, uh, um, no. But, but th this is why certain ufologists will write books with them or will uh, sh share conference platforms with them, etc. To me, they're not really part of ufological research because th their modus operandi is government narrative. Now, the government may or may not have good reasons to chase a black triangle around Sheffield or um, do what they did in Reynoldsham Forest, etc. But w what what I like to know is what is the truth of what is the truth of what really happened. Clark is now the official spokesperson for the National Archives concerning the release of all UFO documents. But Clark, he's a he's a he's steady, steady. <laughs> <All right. laughs> anyway, more on the Sheffield UFO incident after this.